This is the Upper Room with Joe Kelly, and I am very excited, as I have been all week, looking forward to talking to my next guest. He is a consummate musician and a bass innovator. He was an original member of Sly and the Family Stone and a band leader of Graham Central Station and a successful solo artist in which he is still releasing uh, albums. And recently, Rhino Records put together an anthology called The Jam, Larry Graham and Graham Central Station Anthology. And we have the man right here. And welcome to The Upper Room with Joe Kelly. Mr. Larry Graham. How you doing, Larry? I'm going to add some bottom so that the dancers just won't hide. <laughs> I uh, can't handle that. <laughs> you know I'm doing fine. I'm doing yeah. just fine. Dealing with the snow. Dealing yeah. with the snow. And uh, But other than that, everything is fine. They've taught me well how to deal with it up here in Minnesota. That's right. I mean, originally from Texas and then, of course, uh in uh, Northern California, how, how how fast was the acclimation to uh, to the Twin Cities? Well, actually, we were originally from California, as you know, as you said. Uh, but we left California, and my family and I moved to Montego Bay, Jamaica, for seven years. Okay. And then from Montego Bay, we came here, so that was even more of an adjustment. So we've never really lived in the snow before. Um, but it took us a minute to, to learn how to deal with it. And, you know, we didn't have, like, warm coats and boots and stuff like that. You know, not even the right kind of car to deal with it. But we learned quick. And so now we have the things to deal with the snow, so we're all right now. <laughs> so you prepared, and uh, you must be really excited about the, uh, the double CD release on Rhino Records. How closely did you get involved with uh, creating the double CD? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm very pleased with it because I got a chance to be involved with it a lot as far as song selections and um, sequencing and the, the booklet and photographs and well, just the whole the whole nine. And I've really got a chance to be involved, so I'm I'm happy. You you've added uh, some treats for for funk fans and of course Larry Graham fans on there. There's a uh, a live version of I Want to Take You Higher on there from, yeah. from 92 out in Japan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we went to, to uh, Japan in 92, and, and it was really a fun tour, you know, and um, it met with uh, great success. And what really had happened is that uh, Japan actually um, released a lot of the Graham Central Station uh, albums on CDs first before the U.S., and uh, it was a lot of excitement created over there, and... So we were asked, you know, is it possible for the band to come and tour Japan? And so we, we, you know, we put it together and we went and we met with such success. And then the folks back here in the States started hearing about it. And next thing, uh, we were asked to do a U.S. tour, which came off really good. And so, you know, after a while, then uh, the CDs, start, some of them start, started appearing here in the U.S., um, not all of them. Japan had just about all of them. But in time, more and more were released. But now with the anthology, that kind of like covers a lot of ground, which I'm, I'm really happy about. And people can uh, order it from rhinorecords.com, and it's, it's on the uh, Amazon.com, and, you know, readily, readily available. And I, I was just, you know, prior to talking with you, uh, uh, we had a DJ in here, and I bought it recently, the, uh, the anthology, and I was just hoping she didn't take it home with her. <laughs> She, she was getting into the liner notes, so. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that that uh, Ricky Benson did an excellent job on the liner notes. Oh I yeah, he's great. Yeah. We spent hours and hours on the phone, and and uh, because I, I wanted it to be, I want I, he wanted it to be right, but I more so wanted it to be right, and you know he did an excellent job. And then uh, I went over it with a fine tooth comb and tried to make sure, you know, as, as much as I could that everything was accurate. So you know, if, if we missed anything, you know, I, I apologize, but <laughs> we tried to get it all in there, you know, as accurate as possible. So yeah. if it's not 100%, it's close. And and Ricky Vincent, of course, has uh, put out some uh, another funk, uh, you know, it's a book you have to have um, that he released a little while back called Funk, the Music, the People, and the Rhythm of the One. And he's a DJ out in California, so. Yes, yeah. yes he's over in Berkeley. Yeah, yeah. good good, uh, good people you have working with, yeah. Yeah, you know, it was because of the good job that he did on the book that, you know, I felt, 
well, hey, this guy's in my corner. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not only a, a writer, but he's somebody that, you know, really is into, you know, what I do. And so that, that makes a big difference, too. You know, he understands the music. Well, I know a lot of our listeners know your background, of course, being an innovator with uh, with the bass. And, and uh, of course, uh, myself, I, I've been following you for years. But, you know, for our listeners out there, could you uh, relate how you started playing bass? I know you come from a musical family. If you, if you could condense it for us, <laughs> how, you, yeah. how you got into bass. Yeah, well, I started off um, tap dance when I was tiny. And then I started taking piano lessons at an early age. And then I went into um, playing drums in school and uh, uh, playing, I uh, tried out clarinet, which led to saxophone, because uh, they made you take clarinet first and then went to saxophone, and then from there I went into the, the marching band and the school orchestra with drums. And then uh, my father, when I was uh, 11, decided that he was going to not play guitar anymore, and he gave me his guitar. And so uh, it's, it's kind of like that inspired me to want to learn how to play the guitar. So I taught myself, and we uh, I had a band uh, when I was 13. We recorded our first record. And then my mother and I started working together when I was 15. I was on the guitar, uh, my drummer and my mother. And after a while, we changed drummers, and we were playing a bunch of clubs and lounges. And so one t- um, my mother decided that we were going to do a duo. Uh, no, no, what happened before that is um, the, uh, we had an organ at this one club that we played that had the bass pedals that go about halfway across the organ. And I learned how to play the bass pedals with my foot at the same time as playing the guitar and singing. And so we sounded like we had bottom, which we did. Mm-hmm. And we got used to that. But then what happened is the organ broke down, and now we didn't have any bottom, and we sounded empty to us. So I uh, went down and rented a bass temporarily, I thought, until the organ could be repaired. And uh, as it turned out, the organ was too old to be repaired. There was no parts for it. So I was stuck on the bass. And... Uh, because, you know, it just didn't sound right going back to guitar anymore. So then, after a while, my mother decided that she wanted to go duo, just her and I, with no drums. So that's why I started thumping the strings to make up for not having a bass drum and plucking on the strings to make up for not having that backbeat. And that's how the style developed. And over a period of time, then that just became, you know, the way I played. And I never was interested in the overhand style of playing, um, which everyone considered to be the correct way coming from an upright bass. Um, but to me, I wasn't going to be a bass player for long, so I wasn't interested in getting into technique. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to get the job done. That's right. So, you know, despite any criticism or, or not playing correctly or whatever, you know, I just stuck with my thumping and plucking. And then um, through Sly and the Family Stone, then that style became popular, of course, through our records. And, of course, there, there's thousands of bass players out there who have just uh, listened to your records and tried to emulate them. And, uh, you know, you, you being such an innovator on the bass and, and music in general, I, I had, uh, brings to mind, John Blackwell was on my show recently, and I asked him uh, any areas he'd like to imp- improve in his drumming, and he mentioned Latin jazz. How about yourself, uh, you know, working on the bass? Do you see any areas you'd really like to tighten up or... Well, I'm always open myself, you know, and because of that, you know, I'll walk into uh, a new adventure, and, you know, if I don't know it, I'll try to learn it, you know, because I've had the pleasure of playing with, you know, people like, you know, the Crusaders, uh, you know, and they their music is, 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 you know, a little different than Grand Central Station, um, but we, you know, we, we blend it together well. I work with Stanley Clark. Uh, we did a tour of Brazil, of most of the major cities over there. Uh, I worked with Carlos Santana. We did some touring together. I played on both Carlos and uh, um, the Crusaders records. Um, also, uh, oh, just tons of people. I can't even think of all the people. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you play bass uh, nearly every day, or yeah, you put it down and take a break every once in a while? Actually, um, Usually when I pick it up, it's because I'm getting ready to play, play it for real. Okay. I mean, it's not that, you know, I don't discourage practicing, mm-hmm. you know, but it's kind of like what what I know and feel is, is already in my heart. And 
I, I, I get into new areas if who I'm playing with, if it's not my own music, um, you know, requires me to do something different. But other than that, I don't really sit down and practice anything because I, I guess because I guess if you invent a style, what you do is what you do. You only play different notes and, and different patterns, you know, the, to fit the the arrangement. But it really doesn't change what I do. So once I understand in my heart what's required, you know, then it comes from there. So, you know, and, and again, I, I don't just, I don't, you know, try to discourage practicing because I know people that take lessons, they're told practice, practice every day. Every, every, well, you know, I just never, never did that. Right. <laughs> you know, maybe if I was playing another instrument, maybe that's something that I would, I would, I would do because I didn't invent anything on that particular instrument, I'm learning what someone else created of their technique, of their way of doing it. But I guess when it comes from something that's, you know, that you invented, you can't really change that. All you can do is just play it, play it different patterns, you know. Um, and, and again, if somebody requires me to play a different kind of uh, style, you know, because of a different kind of music that we're playing, then I'll learn that. You know, I'll, 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 I will learn that, you know, but in advance, I, I don't go after anything new because when I, when I switched over to bass, I wasn't listening to any bass players because I didn't plan on being a bass player. I, my thing was guitar, you know, but it, it kind of worked out to my advantage listening to guitar players and playing guitar myself because I wasn't afraid to venture off into things that guitar players did as far as playing while uh, playing uh, pedals like fuzz tones and um, you know wah wah pedals and all kind of gadgets that bass players, I mean you know, guitar players would use. Um, I wasn't afraid to do that because I didn't think in terms of just a bass player, you know. So that kind of came to my to my advantage too. And that that's the uh, very interesting take and from Larry Graham's experience, and I'm sure you're uh, a lot of people out there. Digging up on those words, so especially well, bass players, folks, yeah. A lot of folks were trying to figure out, like when Dance to the Music came out, they was trying to figure out, you know, what is that? You know, after I say I'm going to add some bottom, da 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 and that's, again, why I say it's good that I would use things like that because I, I wasn't ex- afraid to experiment. Because back in the day, they didn't make any special effects for bass that I was aware of. You know, and today even, there are some, but nothing compared to what guitar players have, you know. And uh, so, again, it was to my advantage. All right. Larry Graham is my special guest here on The Upper Room with Joe Kelly, and we are discussing in depth the uh, the new double CD anthology, the Larry Graham and Graham Central Station anthology. It's entitled The Jam. It's in your record stores right now on Rhino Records. And we're going to go right into one of my favorite cuts, and this is from Graham Central Station's Release Yourself. It's all right. And uh, Larry had the dance floors packed with this <laughs> one. And uh, you, you still do it off and live. So it's, uh, it's a great song. And uh, a- anything in the studio that... that uh, comes to mind right there with it's all right with it's all with, it's, it's all right. right yeah oh uh, one thing that comes to mind again with the with the uh, the pedal that i used on the uh on the bass that bow, bow, everybody was wondering what in the world is that because <laughs> it was too low for a guitar again it's like okay and uh those pedals at the new at the time were you know very new for guitar but I would try it, everything. And so that became like the foundation sound for for the record, you know, and became the trademark, you know, sound for for that record. Okay, we'll give a listen to it right now. Larry Graham will be back. He's my special guest here on The Upper Room. This is It's All Right by Graham, Central Station. <laughs> 